Guys, ladies and gentlemen, um, podcast number three for the day in the Gold Coast. We've got someone that doesn't need an introduction, so I'm just going to say his name, Matt Lancashire. Thank you for coming on and joining us. May everyone would know where you're at now. Obviously, by your socials, you're massive. Everyone knows who you are. But maybe not a lot of people know where you came from. Can we start back from the start of your journey in real estate, where you started, how you got going, and where, to where you're at now? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for having me, guys. It's an um, absolute pleasure. Um, look, my um, real estate journey wasn't as, um, as uh, flash as some others. Um, so I um, finished school in 98. So it's... Um, and one thing... The year I was born. What? Really? Oh, my God. That makes me feel very old. <laughs> like, but the funny thing is I'm 42 and, and this is legit. I actually feel like I'm 30 years old. So Is it the ice bath? A bit of that. A bit of just looking after yourself, gym training. Um, I love just doing being active all the time and, um, you know, and sauna ice bath every day. And it's um, I, I feel as good. I actually feel better at 42 than when I was at 30, but I feel 30. Really? That makes sense. Yeah. So it's um, for me... Um, that's one of my number one priorities. And I'll, I'll talk about the buckets that I measure my life and, and mm. everything, business and everything, uh, when we go along, uh, later into the podcast. But uh, when I started, I, um, I finished school. Uh, problem I had at school was I actually came from quite an intelligent family. My father's a surgeon. My brother's a surgeon. My mum was a detective with a juvenile aid. My <coughs> sister's a teacher. Um, and I was just not born with um, those genes, unfortunately. And I struggled my way through school. Um, C's and D's? Uh, probably worse than that. You know, maths A, which is like the maths A, is like they call it maths in the beer garden. And it's, um, and um, I failed that, I think, like an E. But one thing I can do now, which is really bizarre, is I can um, calculate the shit out of commission. Uh, but um, look, I struggled my way through school, grade 11 and 12, did remedial reading, just, and it was just a bit of a struggle. And coming from a family that was quite intelligent, I sort of had a big problem with school and just couldn't get into it. I ended up getting an OP, 16 in Queensland, it's OP, so they measure it 1 to 24. 16 is not great, actually, uh, but the difference is I actually tried my ass off and I still got a 16. So I had mates that didn't try at all and they got 15. So, um, so for me, it just wasn't my jam. I sort of had a bit of an issue with it back then because I just think school's really bizarre because they make you navigate the rest of your life at 17 years old. Like, you know, yeah, there's... Careers person at school, what the hell is that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? And I really struggle with that because I, at th that point of time, school didn't tailor to emotional intelligence, which is one of my biggest um, mm. um, strengths now, is the ability to be able to have conversations, talk to people, read people, be empathetic to people where they didn't have that at school. It was either you get an A, B, C, D or E and good mm. luck, here you go. Mm. So I finished school and, and didn't do very well and my parents... Um, sort of said, look, you've got to do something with the life. I was playing tennis a bit too much after school for six months just and mm. just no direction. They said, look, let's take you to this trade careers day. And mm. um, I went into this trade day and they said, okay, here's your choices. Electrician, carpenter or plumber. And I literally put a blindfold over my face and said, that one. And I became an electrician. Um, wow. <laughs> so what was really bizarre, it was, it, was, it, it was a blessing and a curse. I hated it from day one. I just didn't have any direction. I didn't love it. Um, but one thing it gave me in hindsight now is it gave me a really good uh, insight into development, into how houses are put together and being able to, you know, have a, a greater knowledge than most in my industry of how construction works. Um, I finished that trade and what was interesting when I was 17 years old my best mate and I we bought a house at a, at a quite a young age so 17 we moved out of home on apprentice wages we renovated that house and I ended up doing a, a two-year gap trip overseas and it was it was it was fascinating I remember I had zero money and I was sitting in Paris and I made a call to my mate and I said look I want to stay overseas um, I'd been there for about six months but I'm out of cash I reckon we should sell the house and so my mate said yep agreed so we decided to put our house on the market. We chose an agent, um, a Ray White agent actually, and Hazley Cush, who's my now business partner. I knew him very well. Who should we engage to sell the house? Um, so we decided to put the house on the market, went to auction, uh, and it didn't sell. And so a couple of weeks went past. I was calling the agent, what's going on? No, no one wants to buy it. So I was forced to come home, came home, um, got in touch with the agent and said, look, I need a meeting. Agent, her name was um, Flo, and oh. um, her nickname, her slogan was Go With The Flow. Oh. And Flo did not produce a contract, and I wanted to go back overseas. So I asked her, do you mind if I get, get all the list of the people? You had 150 groups through this house, can I call everyone? Uh, and I managed to pull three offers out of it, and we sold it, and I was back overseas. And I thought, geez, that was 
Easy. Anyway, so came back, um, finished two years overseas in London, um, and I rang my uh, very close mate, Hazley Kush. What are you doing? And I was thinking of starting a shoe store, like an Aquila sort of thing. I wish I did that at the time because I think that sold pretty big money. But anyway, <laughs> um, and decided to, Hazley said, no, nah, I think you should get into real estate. And he was desperate. He was 27, 20, 27 years old, started a business called Ray White New Farm. Uh, it was a broken business, ranked 200 in Queensland for um, for the Ray White Group. So it was a busted business pretty much. And he was desperate for salespeople. So he said, yep, you'd be a great agent, come and have a crack. Um, so that was in 2006. And um, it took me six months, so, sorry, it took me nine months to make my first sale. Nine like, months? Nine months, I was really yeah. bad, yeah. Really, really bad. And um, my first sale fell over. Another agent in the office took advantage of that and said, oh, look, I've got a buyer for that. How about I'll get the I'll get over the line, but you've I'll you take twenty, I'll take eighty percent. I did the deal, so because I went overseas, spent all my money, came back, spent all the money from the sale of our house, came back, moved home for the first time, ever. How old were you at this point? At twenty five. And so I ended up getting myself into um, twenty. Uh, at that point in time, it was forty thousand dollars credit card debt. Fuck. And at that time, because I was too embarrassed to tell my parents, and everyone was saying, Matt, do you know what? you've always got plan B, you can always go back and be a, an electrician. And I was like, no, 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 that's not my jam. I don't want to do that. I want to be successful in this. I actually like it. I just haven't quite grasped it and I sort of didn't get it either. Um, and then um, sort of the penny started to drop a little bit. But the problem with anyone that's listening to this podcast, um, debt is a really hard thing, right? So when mm. you have debt and anyone that hasn't been through that debt it's really hard to get through the other side of it. And you always try and cut corners and try and do little deals mm. to try to break the debt down. I remember I had one moment um, where I had to lie to a bank to get a credit card to pay uh, another credit card debt at that point. So it ended up getting into $50,000 debt at one point. Oh, um, and that was a pretty, it was, look, I look back at it and I was so embarrassed to tell my parents about it because they had no idea. Mm. And I was sort of, I didn't want to go back to being, there was no plan B for me. Well, the plan B could have been being an electrician, but that was not a plan. Um, and it sort of got to a point where I just needed to make it happen. Um, so I remember the moment vividly. I, um, I started to do okay. And then it was when 2007, 2008, the boom came in, in mm. obviously. Um, I went and flew down to Sydney and I met with an agent. I rang my mum and I said, look, can I borrow $1,000? I bought a new suit because my suits were busted, bought a new pair of shoes and I bought a flight to Sydney. And I met with James Dack, if you know James yeah. Dack. So he was, um, if you look at James Dack now, his associate at the time was um, Ben Collier. So yeah. Ben Collier from the agency oh. worked for James Dack for years mm -hmm. and um, met with James Dack. And I remember met, met him at a little cafe and went in, um, in Paddington. And I, I remember having this meeting with him and he said, look, um, I, I went in and saw the Wentworth Courier, which is the Eastern Suburbs publication. Before I met him and I was like looking through and there was 20 pages, James Dack, James Dack, James Dack, James Dack. And I was like, wow, this guy must be awesome. He gave me 15 minutes of his time and he said, look, I'm going to give you three pieces of advice and literally had 15 minutes with him. Flew to Sydney, bought new suits, bought new shoes. <laughs> oh. 15 minutes, that's all you've got. Um, and he said, you've got to be a massive advertiser, number one. So true to his word, 20 pages in the Wentworth Courier, absolutely phenomenal. Number two, he said, you need to be an auction agent. You need to run all only auctions. And if in Queensland at that point of time, um, uh, only only 5 to 10% of properties went to auction, right? Wow. And any of the 5 to 10% that went to auction, it was a 20 to 30% clearance rate. So no one wanted to go to auction. It wasn't an auction market. It wasn't an auction culture at all. And the third thing, oh, he, the fourth thing he said, so the third thing he said was you need to run a really systemized structured business. So I was like, yep, okay. And then the fourth was you need to outwork your competition. And so I went back to Brisbane and literally walked into the, our sales meeting and told the <laughs> revolutionized <laughs> things that I heard from James Dack. And um, I literally, my, do you want to have a crack at what my number one goal was when I got back? Clear the debt. Well, that was that was a byproduct of what the number one goal was. Yeah, what it was, was it? become the number one Auction advertiser agent. in the Courier Mail. Wow. So to give you a little bit of perspective on that, when I were in two thousand and seven and two thousand and eight, a single page ad in the Courier Mail for one week was thirteen thousand dollars per week per ad. Oh, what? Yeah. That's yep. massive. Thirteen thousand a week per ad. It, when I started, it was seventeen thousand. Oh, so insane. to do three weeks of full page ads, you'd be looking at thirty-five, forty thousand dollars just in advertising for just the Courier Mail. 
So, and that was my number one goal to do that. And what was really fascinating is I got my start and there was a property uh, on James Street in New Farm where it was on the market with another agent. The sign came down straight away within three or four days. So I rang this guy, it was like on, kept ringing, ringing, ringing. He finally took my call and he said, yep, I'll have you around. I went and he's like, had my paper in my hand, sort of all covered up because no one wants to see when you walk in the front door and they see a paper, they mm. know how expensive it's going to be. And I went and did a, a full listing presentation, said, you've got to do auction, you've got to do ads, you've got to do all these things. And to his credit, got $45,000 advertising, um, got an auction, um, it was had 260 groups through the front door, sold it under the hammer for $2.85 million. And wow. that was my first segue into doing that. Mm. And then it just built and snowballed and snowballed and snowballed. And what's really interesting is the one thing that I, the most valuable, the, probably of the two, all of James Dack's things were really relevant, but the two that really stuck with me were systemized structured business and huge and getting advertising in the career mail. And so for anyone that says, oh, that listens to this, oh, well, that doesn't work because we don't have a paper or whatever. Mm. It all evolves, right? So if you don't have a paper, own REA, own domain, mm. own whatever medium it is in your marketplace that you know you're going to get mm. get traction from. And one of the things I remember um, James said to me, he says, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Mm. And that really rung home with me. And if you look at my business today, so we have uh, my last auctions for the November, I had 14 auctions in November. Um, and have a guess of how many owners you think I had a prior relationship with of all of those owners. I'd say majority, 10. No, four. 10 I didn't know. Wow. So what that is, that is all attraction. So it's a it's a blend. You've got to have a blend of, you know, running your database, repeat customer referral business, and then also the attraction stuff. So ads breed ads. Ads bring more sellers through your front door. So I'm constantly meeting new people, listing their houses. They're calling me in off ads and everything. So it's um it's a full attraction model now. Do, you, do your agents in the, in the office, do they have like a set, budget that they want to spend per listing on social media like a thousand bucks per listing yeah. or well it, it, everyone's different so i've got i run a different model mine's five thousand minimum spend on every campaign yo wow. and that's just straight boosting straight boosting yep. wow um yep. through and, data through data and in in terms of the way that you structure your ads is it just everyone within a core area is it people that you've entered names and numbers into through the back data. end yep. yeah through okay data. so gotcha. we can now so example and it's cost per lead Right, so it's like if anyone says, "Oh, I'm going to do a boost for 300 bucks," save you 300 bucks. It doesn't work. So we use data. So I've gone into so obviously Meta Group owns Facebook and Instagram. So we've got our database. So if we list a property that's five million bucks, I'll then go and and import all of the data in the last 12 months of every property that I've sold or marketed and ha every open home buyer, every auction registered bidder, everything like that. Import the data from three million to seven million all that data and import it in the back of Facebook. We've got an 80% connection rate to people's social media accounts and it's just like fishing with dynamite. So we're doing wow. that, but you can't do that for 300 bucks. It's cost per lead. Yeah. So Meta Group doesn't go, oh, I'll just give you that lead for free. They're yeah. a big juggernaut. So it's all about the spend. You can't do that without Half spending. No, nah, you can't. And it's, it's like, and if we're putting in 4,000 bits of data, what are they going to... They're not going to spit out 4,000 bits of data, but there's also the retargeting stuff as well, which we're doing. So, and lookalike audiences. So, yeah. we all dial ups and, you know, so if someone clicks on it, you get their IP, then you just dial it up. And I had a customer once that, you know, she's like, she came through at the first open home, put it... And every week after every open, we put their data into Meta. So, it just keeps targeting them straight after that. And I had a lady come through. She's like, she came through the third open home. She's like... Man, it's meant to be. It's just showed up on my, oh. on my phone again. The only wow. reason I, she, she worked this out is she bought it at auction. She, we went to her house to list her house and she's like, um, oh, I don't believe in that Facebook shit. It doesn't work. And I said, oh, do you remember when you said it's meant to be? That was what that was. Wow, that's huge. So it's pretty cool. Our market's all expats and um, as well and interstaters. So people go, oh, how do we market to expats in this state? Through data. If I went, so for example, if I said I want to find a buyer in Sydney mm. to look in Brisbane and I just went and dropped a pin over Double Bay, statistically yeah. not going to find anyone. Like the people in Double Bay aren't necessarily going, oh, I'm going to go buy in Brisbane. So it's a waste of money. So we do it through data. And then what we do is, so to give you an example of expats, a lot of my clientele are Hong Kong expats coming back. Wow. They used to have to go to Sydney and Melbourne, but they come to Brisbane now. They go, we can work from anywhere with COVID. Um, and... Um, 
Brisbane's a little bit different to what it used to be. So people are coming back. They hadn't been home for a long time. They're coming, they're seeing the Calvile, they're seeing great schools, easy place to live. And they're, and they're coming in droves. So we're seeing 1,500 people a week coming into southeast Queensland. 1,500? Wow. A week. Fuck. And we've got a housing crisis as well at the moment. So development stopping, well, has put the brakes on because construction's so expensive. There's not as many apartments coming out of the ground. There's not as many developments happening. So where are they actually going to go? So we found stock levels just this year alone are down 30%. Buyer inquiries up 30%. So it's been this perfect storm. Even wow. with even with all the interest rate rises, not not even one p- part of an impact on the inner city of Brisbane. Wow. Um, so what we've been able to do with those expats, so for example, an expat buys one of our properties, we put all of his data, it comes through, data comes in, we put into Facebook. We can then go lookalike audiences through Facebook. Ah. And so if you're a Hong Kong expat sitting in Hong Kong and you want to and generally your circles that you're that you're hanging out with over there are there expats doing the same thing when they come back? So we then target all their friend circles. Fuck, I've and got so, to do that. So I've sold two. I've sold two properties. One for one million five hundred, one million five million, one hundred and fifty thousand, uh, to an expat from Hong Kong. Sold one around the corner for just over six million dollars to their friend, unbeknown to each other, were buying in Queensland. Wow, pretty cool. So, so how would you find the data of buyers that are expats though? What do you mean? Oh, well, because they've inquired. Okay. So it's yeah. anyone so that's actually inquired. inquired. Yeah. You've, you've got to have the data. Mm. Yeah. So that's the key, right? I need to get this data. Well, you do, it's just by, well, you've got to list more properties and meet more people. Yeah. Mm. I'm thinking, because I'm a buyer's agent and I'm thinking about bringing my business up here. Yep. I'm like, how would I get the yeah the traction? And that's a fucking really good idea. It's huge. It's, ma- it's a massive part. And this is an evolving thing. Like this, mm. wasn't, this wasn't happening five years ago. This wasn't even happening like that three years ago. And it's like... I remember when I made a shift from onto social media, I remember my business partner, Hazley, he'd be like, don't waste your time with that shit. You're just spending so much time on social media. And I'm so glad that I did it like five years ago. Like I just started to just keep going with it and then it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, Is it possible now to start and do it again? Absolutely it is, but it's just the algorithms are getting harder. Mm. Oh man, it's hard. Yeah. Like I don't understand it. It's, um, and people are doing too much personal stuff on there. It's like your digital footprint, like how do you look on social media? Mm. So this is what we do with all, all of our stuff is like, have a look at yourself online and work out if you're a, a potential future client, would you list with you? you know, yeah. I don't think clients like to see people doing like shooters at 12 o'clock at night, you know, <laughs> on, a, on a Friday yeah. night when they're meant to be at opens on a Saturday. Yeah, no, definitely you know not. I mean? so, but most people don't have those boundaries. Yeah. Um, you, you must not have a lot of boundaries in terms of work, though, because you're here recording a podcast with us while this is your second week of holidays. What's your why? You must have a really big why for, for, for you to be dragging yourself into Dane Hutherton's office to record this on a holiday. Oh, no, it's, I, like, I like doing these things. I like, um, and I think I spoke to you on the phone about it, about, you know, just I like giving pain forward into the industry. I know our industries, look, it's um, unfortunately there's, you know, it does have a few horror stories, but like mm. anything, and it's a really interesting segue, and this is probably going to be a bit vulnerable, but I nearly got out of real estate about oh, about a year ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, just because I, uh, it, well, it was, a, it was a moment, but it was a build-up of about five years where, where you, when you're an agent, you're outward-facing, right? You're yeah. always on the front line with the general public. Um, real estate has such a, bad name unfortunately and I was sort of trying to defend myself defend the industry one person one transaction at a time um, and I just remember I just got to breaking point and um, I was standing and I'm sure a lot of agents can resonate with this it's um, when you're sitting at the front of an open home and you get rude people come to you all the time and they judge you before they know you they you know mm-hmm. you because you're out in the public all of the time you know you always have people say oh he's a dickhead or he's a wanker or whatever mm. just because they're a real estate agent and they don't actually know you. Mm. And I remember I had this one moment I went to, an, I was at an open home and I had this, uh, these two people come through and my father's a surgeon, right? So I remember I rang my dad and I said, hey, is this your, I've heard you talk about it. And he's like, yeah. But anyway, when, I, when they walked in, I was like, g'day, I'm Matt, how are you going? And this is after COVID, like I'm talking like, this is within the last 12 months. I, and I always ask, do you shake hands still? Like just to be courteous. That's I always do that. 
and I went to shake, oh, do you shake hands? She's like, no, we don't shake hands. And I was like, oh, okay, that's no worries. And she goes, and by the way, don't call me after this open two, we're not interested. Like, this is before she'd even walked through the place. And I'm like, a bit rude, you know, and I've been doing this 17 years. Like, and it's not like I'm, you know, starting out and haven't done a good thing, like, and mm. quite successful at what I do. And it was just one of these things that just, it was, it was, mm. it was, it was starting to get to the, like the boiling pot for me. Mm. And, um, Two seconds later, that person walked up to the, another person in the open home. Oh, hug and shake hands and all of that. And I was like, this is crap oh. anyway. So on the way out when they, when they were leaving, um, I said, what do you think? She said, I said, don't call me after this. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Well, just, just before you go, are you a doctor? And she's, they're like, why would you ask me that? And I said, oh, you might know my father, Ray Lancashire. And their jaw dropped and literally went to, um, went to shake my hand. I said, no, I don't shake hands. Anyway, after it, wow. what happened was it was it was a really bizarre moment in my whole career because it's like I'm not a bad person, right? I try to do right yeah. by everyone, and then it was just this one thing where I think I was fed up, and it pushed me to the to a point where I was like, it pushed my brain into a place I didn't want to go, and mm. it was like me trying to justify that I'm better than you, that or I probably do better than you financially, and I like literally my brain went, what the fuck am I actually doing here? So I went and saw a psychologist for the first time, mate. It's crazy, oh, crazy. Wow. What and was that so, experience like? The psychology, um, life changing, to be honest. Um, so I went and saw her just because I was literally, I was out. I, I remember ringing my business partner Hazley and said, "Mate, buy my shares out. I'm done. Don't, oh, don't, wow. I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm fucking, I'm done." Wow. And um, and it was interesting. I went, I went and met her, and she was, she was really, really good. Like, and she's like, so asking about my family, asking about my childhood, asking about all these things. And have I always been a fighter, like to try to prove that I'm better than something, but I've never thought this way, right? And she said, but you think it's about real estate. It's not about real estate, it's about you. Because let's look at it. Are there, are there shonky real estate agents? Of course there are. Are there shonky priests? Yeah, they are. Are there shonky doctors? Yes, there are. Are there shonky, you know, um, lawyers? Absolutely, there are. So it's not about industry. It's about your perception. And so what she did is she unbelievably trained my brain to actually go, why would you actually care with everything you've got on going on in your life? Mm. Family, friends, great business, you know, um, ha happy, healthy why would you actually care about what people think of you when they don't know you and they yeah. haven't even given you the opportunity? So what she's done is she's reframed, retrained and programmed my mind to actually come from a place of fuck you to are you okay? I, I, yeah. You must have something going on in your life that you actually are trying to cut the legs off someone that you don't know and you actually have a perception of them that they're someone that you don't actually have a clue about. Yeah. And the moment I changed my brain around that, mm. I, I'm free. I, I feel free in my life, in my head, in my everything. And I feel like I can give so much more and I'm loving real estate even more. And so I'll get someone that, come, that comes to my open, I'm rude and I'll just kill them with kindness and sit there and go, do you know what, far out. If they're coming to my place of work and being like that, imagine the shit that they must have going on in their life at home. Yeah. And when you change that perception around, and look, it took a bit of training, a bit of time, but now that I've got it, you can't, you, you, you can't shock me. You can't like, you can't break me. And I oh, actually I don't, it, I don't actually care. I don't actually care. And why would you care about what someone thinks about you that doesn't know you or give you the opportunity to know you? Does that make yeah. sense? Hey, that's powerful stuff. It's bloody awesome. And that's why I said to you before about social media. Yeah. Like I now. I now sit there like I went up to Hamilton Island for a mate's fortieth, and time. it was awesome. And mate, on a huge yacht, all these things, and I had no—I did not even feel like I wanted to post because I was around the people I wanted to be with. And who was my target market? What piss clients off? Maybe piss, yeah, or maybe inspire young people to work harder. But who cares? Like it's like I was with my wife, I was with my mate, I was with all the people I cared about. Why do I need to form that to me? I don't actually care. And it's actually been so powerful. So it's all gone, well, if I'm with you, I'm with you. If I'm not, like, that's, you know. And yeah. it's, it's, it's actually really, really it's, it's been a breakthrough considering being 17 years in the industry. People used to say, when are you tapping out? And I'm like, geez, now I reckon I've got another 17 in me. 
mm. easily and loving it, loving it. Wow, that's it, man. Especially if you're feeling 30 again. Mate, I feel good. Let's go. Rock feel and good. Roll. <laughs> um, man, do you reckon we can touch on, at the start of the podcast, you mentioned something about these buckets? Yes. Yeah. Is that a good segue to... to totally. Well, probably um, there's, there's probably one segue before that, I yeah, reckon. Go. So there's different seasons of... Um, for say you're a young real estate agent listening to this or someone that's sort of wanting to get to the next level, there's a few little stages in there which um, which I went through, right, to break through to that next level. So if you look at it, um, there's the learning stage, which is your first sort of couple of years, like probably two to three years where you're learning everything. Like you're going into an industry, most people don't have real estate experience, so they're going in learning a whole new new trade. And mm. effectively, it's an apprenticeship to get into real estate, uh, to, to, to be a real estate agent. Then it gets to the building stage, right, which is which is really cool because it's like you get that little bit of success and then you get to a level where, you know, let's just say you're a five, six, seven hundred thousand dollar rider and you're going, okay, well, I'm going pretty well here, really happy, and you're just trying to break through, right? There's a it's really interesting. I don't know about you guys, but when I got to that stage there, a question that went into my brain was around not around how am I going to get to the next level, but it was like, am I worthy of it? Am I actually worthy of getting to the next level? Mm. Which was like, you know, most people will get there and they'll go, because what you see is a lot of people get to that stage and then there's a huge drop off backwards, right? Yeah. So if you look at the market that's just gone now um, through COVID, so Ray White Group as a, as a group had a record number of elite performers, which is sort of 600 plus riders, right? For in GCI. They had, I think it went up by 30%. And then the drop off when the market sort of corrected, dropped off down back to under 30%. I think it was even more than 30%. And um, what's really interesting is, what do you do to get to that next level again, right? And it's the one, first part is accepting the fact that you're worthy of doing it and that you just haven't flat flipped it. Do you know what I mean? So you mm. get to that and you go, Far out. I like this success, but do I actually? Uh, do I, Can I keep going? Can I do it? Do I have the capacity to do it? Do I want it? Do I want it? Right? And how do I break through to the next level? And that's why in most groups that you see, like real estate groups, they go elite performer, chairman, elite performer, right? Mm. Because it's this different tiers, right? But then what do I need to do to do that breakthrough? And it, this is the one thing that no one actually ever talks about. And like, because I've been trying to work it out forever, and it's um. There's a thing called sacrifice, mm. right? Sacrifice. So, and that's the only way you can break through because I've got mates in my life, right, that are the, were the smartest at school, the best at school, all of those sorts of things. And they picked a field, like whether uh, you look at, say, you had an OP1 or whatever, you guys, what's your measure in Sydney? For, oh. for uh, OPs at school, school? What's that? Uh, HSC. Oh, HSC, HSC, yeah. So, so so is it like 100%? Yeah, eight I had 100%. Yeah, so most people back in the day, you get 100%. They either used to go into physio or, or doctor yeah. or engineer or something mm. like that because they were forced that way. I've got mates of mine now who are some of the smartest, best operators ever and they're struggling to make ends meet now because it's mm. like they chose a field which is like they're, they're sort of capped, right? Yeah. And the hardest thing for them now, I've had mates who are so smart that have gone... Jeez, maybe I should have a crack at real estate. But do you know what? I've left it too late. I've got a mortgage. I've got kids. I've got this. I've got that. And unfortunately, the one thing that they're going to miss out on is they can't see, they can't sacrifice it because there's too much risk there. But if they mm. took the actual risk, that would be it would be massive, massive, right? So a lot of these younger people that or anyone, not just younger, anyone that goes really well, the sacrifice is the number one thing that it will either make or break their career, right? So for example, when I decided to make, I became obsessed about real estate, right? So I was on this journey of like, it was just my business just kept 2Xing, 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 2Xing. And it was like, I had no children. Um, I had, I literally burned through girlfriends at that point of time, like 30 underwear. It was like, because they- Because of I, the blue eyes or what? Oh yeah, so I <laughs> It was because they would, they would be waiting around at home. When are you coming home? I don't know. Mm -hmm. and that was my journey was like it's either you come on the journey or you don't come on the journey and a lot of people can't do that and I could see it so clearly right I remember my own 30th birthday party I was I was two hours late to my own 30th <clears throat> birthday party wow my mates were filthy filthy 
like absolutely filthy. And I remember I, I hired a house down in Byron for all of our mates just to have a big, um, it was our missed 40th, so we had our 40th, so it got cancelled with COVID. And so I hired um, Mark Bruce's house actually down in, in, um, Did you yeah, in Byron, yeah. That's cool. And had all of our mates there and everything. And we we're sitting around that night and a few of the boys just said, you know what, I get it now. I get why you, well, I, I get why you did this. I get why you missed these things. And I get all of that. And that's the sacrifice part, right? <clears throat> and if you see any person that's on this journey, like you look at some of the best in the industry, you look at, let's say, Alexander Phillips, you look at Gavin, you look at all Josh Tesla, all those guns, right? Sacrifice, mate. Like they mm. work their asses off to get through that breakthrough stage. And once that's interesting for anyone that wants to know how to do it and what you do is you make that sacrifice. And then once you break through, it becomes easy. Mm. It becomes easier. Like it, it just, you can see clearly business comes to you, but you've got to get through that stage because what happens is otherwise you just drop back off and you're like, oh, it's the market, the market's fucked, it's this, it's that. It's like, no, 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 you just haven't sacrificed. That's that's it. Would, wow. would you call that barrier like mil, mil and a half, that, that the barrier at the moment? Depends on whatever it is. Like it's, um, look. For, you, for momentum. Well, when you, momentum, oh, yeah. it's when you get a team, when you get yeah. like, you know, you, so I reckon once you break a mil, yeah. That's where you well you see people that have just hover at a mill. It's yeah. when you want to get like right into it, like the fours, five, sixes, right? That's when it's like and, and this is like so my business is there now, I'm at the five mil mark and it's like and I'll be honest, it's I do it I I won't say like easily, but I do it I've got a great team around me and a really good structure base around me. And what's really interesting is if you look at um I don't know if you guys have read Atomic Habits by James yeah. Clear. Mm-hmm. My whole business is based on that book. So everything, all marginal gain. So I say to my team, I want to be the best in world, best in industry at the activities that I do. That's it. So wow. everything we do, we want to be 1% yeah. better or every single day on everything. And it's like what most people do is they'll go, oh, I'm going to write 5 million bucks this year. And then they go, how are you going to do it? And they go, no, I'm just going to do it. And it's like, yeah, cool. So it's like running a marathon. I want to do a marathon in three hours. Mm-hmm. And then they don't eat well, they don't sleep well, they don't do their training, they don't do their fart leg training, they don't do their hill sprints, they don't do their short runs, long runs, all of that. And they could probably finish it, but they're not gonna do it in three hours. Do you know what I mean? So my team, we sit there and I say, okay, we've literally every quarter, we redefine all of our our role to go over the over the plan again. I only do eight things in my business, that's it. And just specialize and wanna be best in industry in those eight things that I do. And it's, um, and what's happened is over time, it's become, a bit easier we are still I'm still following every single because I've got agents in my industry in my area in my office that start at the same time as me and they're writing seven million I'm writing five million same wow. market why probably yeah. a little bit of sacrifice probably a little bit of um have you ever seen someone crack through the million barrier and get into the two plus by having more of a light work-life balance without sacrificing oh. I'm the wrong person to ask about work-life balance because I think work-life balance doesn't exist in your first 10 years of real estate. Mm. If like, if, and that comes to sacrifice. Like was, it. Was it, the sacrifice worth it? Me, yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. Oh, yeah, mate. Like, it's my life is like, I've like, I, I love everything that I've got in my life. I've got four beautiful children. Um, we're about to do an incredible build on our house in Brisbane. We've got a place at the coast. We're like, everything's, life's, and life's pretty chill as well. It's, um, you know, I've changed my life and it's probably a segue back into your buckets thing. So I measure my lot, whole life on three buckets. One is family, friends and relationships. That's one bucket. Um, the second bucket is wealth, creation, investments and, my, and real estate. And the third is health, well-being and fitness. And so what I used to be really good at was doing two of the three really well and one would suffer. Mm. So for example... Business would be humming, family would be um, humming, but I'd be a bit pudgy, a bit like tubby, not feeling good, really? right? Yeah. Or my family would be great, I'd be fit as fuck, and then my uh, and then the business would suffer. And so I've worked it. I've actually worked it out. This is me in a nutshell. So, <laughs> so it's um, and so I've, I've 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 actually worked it out because I used to run, trying to one hundred and ten percent in each bucket at all times. Mm. Right, always. As soon as you do that, everything will fail. And I'm sort of working this out the older I'm getting because the older I'm getting, I know, like, even I feel good, 
my training's different. Like I'm not going to go and do a 200 kilo squat anymore. No chance. Like I, mm. I don't need to do heavy weights. I don't need to do those things. I just want to feel good. You know, I want everything to be like, I want to be lean and all those things, but I don't want to be a big beefcake and all that because it's not good for your body. Like you're injury prone now. Like I'm 42 years old. Like I just had a bulging disc in my back just from like, just I've been out for 18 weeks purely based on trying to run a marathon and did it in the gym. And it's like, made me feel I went to a pretty dark place because I was doing 35 k's runs on a su- Sunday to now that so now I've got to just modify everything I do around my back so say so 5k runs or 30 35 35 k runs, k yeah. runs. Yeah, oh yeah. my god so it was um, and doing it like I don't listen to headphones oh that's that's the next level and my favourite bit's from 25 to 35 right that's where it that's where the pain <laughs> comes that's, that's what I love but it's when you get your, your heart rate right you know sitting at 149 150 beats a minute sitting at that pace sitting What's around your average, um, pace per kilometer 545 just for the long runs yeah how do you how do you structure your day because you obviously you'd mentioned uh hot and cold therapy you're obviously mentioning exercise how do you structure everything into your day yeah and so, and bef- and so we don't get sidetracked Ta- tell me how you, yeah tell me how you okay it's yeah. a good one yeah so I've, I've dropped every single bucket down to 85 percent that's the key. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it's like, because if you do 110 in every bucket, you're going to burn, right? So for me personally, I've dropped my weights down and there's one thing that I've, that I've learned in the last 12 months, which has been an absolute game changer for me. <laughs> sleep. Eight, oh. eight hours sleep every night. Eight yeah. hours sleep every night. With an alarm clock? Or without an alarm clock to wake up? Uh, I set an alarm, but I usually wake up before my alarm. Uh, what happens when you can't switch off your brain? You can. I can't. Yes, you can. I think I can't. you got to just try harder. <laughs> so do you know what? The, the, anything, the only thing that I'll feel anxious about mm. is if I feel like I haven't given it every opportunity the day before and I'm thinking mm. about it the next day. So I try to tick every box before the day's out, right? Wow. So if I have a, 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 an, an issue at work with, a, say, a, a client, a vendor or something like that, make the call. It's harder not to make the call than it is to make the call. Do you know what I mean? So just get it done. Anything that's going to make you feel anxious to go to sleep about, make sure you clear it off the, the, the day before or do it that day and write a list of all the things you need to do. Like, and so I, they're the only times I feel anxious or guilty about something if I feel like I haven't given 100% to resolve whatever it is mm. on that day. So, and I do have a pretty good like, tolerance level now of like, being able to, if, and I feel like if I've done everything right and I haven't, I've, I've done everything right, um, I'm fine, totally fine. Yeah, okay. And it's like stress is a killer, mate. Stress yeah, is a yeah. big killer. And it's like if you're feeling stressed, you know, you got to probably, you know, exercise a little bit more, go and talk to someone about it. Like, mate, mm-hmm. I, my whole life, I used to stress about what people thought about me, mm-hmm. literally. I used to think about a, a social media post before I posted it because I th- thought about what people would think. I could not give two fucks mm-hmm. anymore. Like, literally, and if someone actually feels like that, are they, they're going to troll you or whatever. Man, that's sad. So yeah. sad. And you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, uh, it, it, it literally, for me now, I can literally sl- go to sleep, no worries. I like, to, and I train every day. So, so the eight hours sleep. Eight hours sleep. Every day for me has been an absolute game changer. Try not to drink between Monday and Fridays. Is there caffeine in the week? Absolutely. Yeah, but, well, I've got one and two, two long blacks every day. That's okay. it. But ha- nothing great in the morning early, ne- never after 12. Where do you fit in the ice bath and sauna? So this is the other thing, right? So the everyone likes to go, and this is not this is just seasons of life, right? So I've got four kids now. Um, so when we had our fourth child, um, I wanted to obviously when my wife was pregnant, she needed help at home with the kids in the morning. So what I have been able to do by obviously been doing, I'm not saying that everyone can do this, but this is just my season of life, which has made it really good for me is I ended up um, moving my training sessions to lunchtime. So go to bed at 9.30, I can sleep until six, get up with the kids, make their breakfast, do their lunches, drive them to school 8.30 every morning, right? I intrude the kid drop off every day. That was my time to be able to hang with my kids, spend quality time, you know, uninterrupted time with the kids as well, which is really important. They're at my, I've got an eight-year-old, six-year-old, four-year-old and a seven-month-old now. So being spending, um, um, authentic, genuine, valuable time with them is really important to me. 
mm. um, and doing the school drop off, which is really cool. Um, so that's allowed me now to go to bed at 9.30, 9 o'clock, wake up at 6, there's eight hours, easy. And, yeah. no. and do you know what? Stop scrolling Instagram before you go to bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fuck, it's you, so, you it's so in, bad. You get, you get into that little, you go down that rabbit hole, mate. It's so bad. I look up, it's midnight. I'm like, what is yep, going on? Yep, totally. Or even, it's like what James... James Clear says, mate, you've got to break those cycles. So if you come home and all lounge chairs uh, face in the direction of a TV, right? So most people go there, go, they get into a habit. They'll get mm. home, oh, it's been a shit day, I'm so stressed. Go and get a red wine, go and sit in front of those shows, then binge on watch shows till one o'clock in the morning and they go, fuck, I've got to get up tomorrow morning and then go training and then you don't train, then you feel guilty and then all those sort of things. You miss your sleep, you're doing six hours sleep. I used to think I could run on five hours sleep Fuck. Always used to do that my, for, for 10 years of my life. Mm. And it was always, you know, I'd go up and down all the time with my health. And then it got to a point where I was, I was like, nah. So I see, I see a trainer three days a week. Um, it was amazing. It's amazing what you can do in those days. But the other days I'd sit there and I'd do, I'd do my own training as well. So I try to train five days a week, do yoga on a Saturday. I've now got into Pilates, which is amazing. Um, Everyone that says, oh, Pilates is not hard enough. You haven't tried Pilates. Pilates is it's really, hard. It's, really, it's really good. It's actually really hard. It's really good. Gavin actually. Rinstein does Pilates. It's, it's, it's too a, hard. It's, it's amazing. It's changed my life. Like I do two private sessions a week now, which is amazing. Wow. It's like, and I feel, I, that's probably why I feel so good. Um, but yeah, so I train every, I make the time to train. So I'll either do a sauna or an ice bath after the training session. So I'll always tag it on. But what happens is I drop the kids at school from 8, 8, 8, 15 so i'll be in the office by 8 30 then i'll do be super productive all the way through till 12 then i have my pt session go get lunch after that back in the office by two super productive till however monday tuesday nights is generally till eight o'clock um usually then i'll try wednesday thursday i'll try to get home feed the kids then just work from home after that and then fridays i'm at home 4 30 every friday 4 30 yeah and then That's saturday awesome. i work but this is the problem right like most people go, oh, work-life balance, real estate, it's hard. It's, I might take a day off during the week because I work Saturdays as well. Mm. Absolute bullshit. You cannot... You, mm. you, if you you can afford to take a day off during the week because you work a Saturday, you don't have enough on. Mm. So we, I can't afford... So I've done 17 years of six days a week. And what's funny is if I do have a Saturday off when I'm not on holidays, I'll be like scrolling or ringing people what's going on with the, with the deals I'll be at a wedding I'll be like text me what's going okay. on all that sort of thing and that's because I love it as well yeah. you know mm. but when I'm off I'm off when I'm on I'm on and there's a there's a big there's a big distinct definition that so like literally so I'm off now and it's like I'm down the coast it's I'm with my family it's amazing um, like literally turn all my my phone's diverted I've got my I've turned off all of my emails, turned off all of my WhatsApp notifications. Wow, that's awesome. yeah, and it's like it's it's actually being able to have very good quality time to, with yourself and with your family. Down here, I've set up a um, I've got a wellness center in uh, in our garage. I've set up Swanner Ice oh, Bath nice. in there, a little gym. Oh, so we can do it every day. That's so it's it. Like, Let's go. Let's but go. it's weird now because it's in my life. I literally I'll look up hotels anywhere around the world when I go for a trip. And one of the main, the big deciders of whether I go to that hotel is one if it's got a sauna or an ice bath in it, or if it's got a sauna or an ice bath facility around it somewhere. Wow, that's killer! How long have you been with that, doing that routine? Five years. Five years with ice bath sauna. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's game changing. Yeah. Game absolutely game changing. So before any auctions, so my business partner Hazley knows that if we have auctions on, he knows my routine. If it's on a Saturday morning at the Carlisle. I've got yoga at six, six or seven, then sauna, ice bath. If it's a, a nighttime one, I'll finish at four. If it starts at six, I'll finish at four, go sauna, ice bath till um, four, four to five, then into the auctions. And it just changes how you feel, how your brain feels, how you like. It just, it just makes me a better, better fun, like, functioning person. It's like a runner's high, isn't it? Like, I love it, mate. It like increases your dopamine levels, gives me clarity, makes me feel good. It's amazing. So it's. Um, why wouldn't you? Is, is the routine you run now, can that routine be implemented for someone that's in the breakthrough period where they need to be sacrificing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, 
when you're in the breakthrough phase, yes, you can. But what happens is, I, I don't know, I was, um, I went the other way. I'd be sitting in the office and I got quite pudgy because I was like literally working in the office. It was like this really nice Indian shop across the road. <laughs> <laughs> roll, over, roll over there at seven o'clock at night. If, if, if I knew myself the way I know myself now, I wouldn't have done what I did then. I would have been the healthy, fit way. Yeah. Um, I'd be up and down, but I, I also didn't have my buckets in check either. So I'd be like, yeah. I'd either be, you know, girlfriend going really well and spend trying to do a little bit of time yeah. there and then the business would be suffer, but then my health would be good and then I could never get it all balanced out right. Um, but I think the key is for anyone that does it, you can't do everything at 100%. Yeah. You, you can't do it. You'll burn out at some point. So you can you can dial it down a little bit, and it's um. And let's be honest, most people that sit there and say I work long hours, it's all bullshit. It's, it's about productive hours as well. Mm. So look, we get paid to work when other people aren't working, and it's um. And what I find one of the biggest problems we have now with younger people or anyone in real estate is DocuSign has been the worst problem <laughs> we've ever seen. Is because they'll send a, a contract to someone that lives two streets away. Mm-hmm. Without actually going to see them face to face, so it's um, yeah. so you know what I mean. But it's um, yeah. but now if I was if I was to do it again and to answer your question, I'd be doing it. I'd be doing knowing what I know now. I'd be doing what I'm doing now then, then for sure, yeah. and I would have had much more success rate and quicker. Hundred percent. Yeah. Um, did you set the Brisbane record? Yeah. A while back. Is this still the record? Yeah. yeah so I've wow. the Brisbane record three times. So I broke it originally in 2015 with a property um, called Ballum, 33B Harbour Road, which sold for 11.8. Then I backed it up in 2017 uh, with a house, One Leopard Street, which sold for 18.48 million. And I've just broken it again this year for of um, 101 Wellsby Street, which settled two months ago for 20.5. Wow. 20.5 for a house. So everything yes. is picking up. Well, yep. what, what's it like breaking a city record? Because um, uh, this the, doesn't happen often. The, the first time it was, um, it was, it was really exhilarating because it was like, I, I didn't think that I was the person I got given an opportunity where I hustled my way into it and broke it. Um, so that was like the greatest thing I'd ever, that was like a lifetime achievement for me. And yeah. it's, um, and then the second one was I felt relieved, yeah, really okay. relieved. And then the third one I was like I was I was back to being re-energized again because it was uh it's because I sort of wasn't the one hit wonder or the mm. you know I didn't fluke the second one. It was just of the only person that has broken it three times in Brisbane still hold it right now as we speak. So it's um and so no one can take that away from you. You know like yeah. you you get your competitors that'll be like oh yeah do you know what oh oh Maddie got lucky on that. So like, oh yeah three times lucky yeah. <laughs> where's, your, where's, your, where's your prison record <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> so, it, um, um, in terms of leverage how do you leverage the sale did you just go hard on social media or totally, well it changes so it was interesting so the first the first time I broke it for their 11.8 million I, I went and looked up every single house I thought would be worth over 5 million dollars invited them through the open we were allowed to do open homes on that house um, we had 447 groups through and met a shitload of um, wow. met a shitload of owners that came through there, rang them all with a result after, did massive direct marketing, dropped them all to all of the people that all the people I wanted to target. Um, that's how I met the owners of One Leopard Street, um, gave them the confidence to go to market and sold that for 18.48 million. Did that again with every other owner again and then just snowballed and then after that it's like you mm. built your database. I sort of, I run a database of about 1,700 people on the database. Um, I have a sale price around four, 4.5 million now. Wow. Um, and so, but you know, there's been a heap of sales this year. They're $20 million, a couple of $10 million, a couple yeah. of 11s, all that sort of thing. So yeah. Been, a couple been, of the grayer sales. A couple of what we sold. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're Sculpt and Scorpio, one for 10, one for 9 million, four, uh, yeah. 9 million, 9.25 million. This one, which was good this year. So we've got another one hopefully coming up with grayer shortly. How does someone get in the door with um, a big time developer like the grayers? Like how would you position yourself to actually, because they're selling with you and they're selling with a couple other top dogs yeah. how would how would you go hey guys I, I should actually be the one selling these houses um, yeah it's a, it's a good well I can tell you what happened with Greyer it's um, so I I'm based in New Farm Paddington's another area mm. um, just off like probably 4k on the other side of the city 
Um, and obviously Grail were building their house builders at that point of time. They were just going up and up and up and up. Um, they had a great relationship with a great agent, still have a great relationship with that agent. Um, and um, But it was just probably a timing thing where we had New Farm was a super tight market, mm. not a lot of stock available. High price, so in New Farm you get, um, to, compared to Paddington, you get, so if, uh, I take a buyer to Paddington from New Farm, they get 20% bigger house, 20% bigger land, 20% less price. Wow. So it was a really good way to be able to take buyers through to benefit them, right? Mm. And we had a lot of buyers that would say, hey, we New Farm's priced us out, we can't afford New Farm. So I remember reaching out to Rob on Insta and said, hey, I've... Um, there's a good direct correlation here. I know you've got a relationship. I'm not here to sabotage that relationship at all, but I want to show you what I could do with the buyers that are coming from New Farm. Would you just give me one? Oh, wow. Did it. Bang, nailed it. Got 20% over. And then Rob's now, he's a very, very, very great loyal client, which we've been working. Great listener too. Some Rob, if you're listening to this, come on the potty. Yeah, get your buddy. No worries. He'll be. He's great, yeah. man. They're they're just they're just so good at what they do. They're just yeah. they're they're Please. great marketers. They're great. They build a great product. We just sold Scorpia for Rob um, and Insane Andy, house. which was great. We sold that for ten million bucks. Um, interestingly enough, the buyer came off the career mail. Oh, wow. um, passive buyer, not in the marketplace. Rob was always like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Let's wow. just do a buy called Bang. Sold for ten million to that buyer that was wow. not in the market for a property. And that was the whole reason why I do print for that whole reason, the passive aspirational buyer. Um, and, you know, it worked really, really well. And our relationship has just flourished over the years. And I think I've sold oh, shit, probably 15, maybe 20 houses for Grey now. That's amazing. Which is pretty cool. So it's a good relationship. But it's like, you know what, you do a good job. Repeat referral business is huge. You know, I've got mm. a really good repeat referral business where I don't get caught. They don't call anyone else in. They just, you know, they, they know what I do for them. They know how I negotiate. They know how we represent their properties. And that's been a time thing. Um, and we just do it over and over and over and over again. And it makes a great relationship. In, um, in Sydney, in the area of the whole Northwest District, with, which encompasses you know, tens and tens of thousands of houses, there's one, maybe two agents that have been there for 10 plus years that are actually still doing well. You've been able to do this and have the longevity over a long period of time. How come you've been able? How have you been able to do that? Yeah. Well, I don't deviate from the plan. Like I rock up, and it's it's a process driven industry, right? Ooh. Process it's, focus. It's, it's uh, totally process. Everything is about having the best the best possible um, processes I can have. Like I said, we're always we're always looking to um, to improve on our processes. So. I've got eight key focuses I focus on, that's it. And it's like, we want to be best in the industry, best in the world. And what I say to my team every single time is, I'll say, okay, and this is a James Clear thing. I go, if we have perfect processes, my number one goal is to have 10 out of 10, like literally the perfect processes. And if we write a million bucks rather than writing 5 million bucks and we run the perfect processes, hmm. I'm happy that's a win. Wow. But guess what? If you run the perfect processes, 10 out of 10, you ain't gonna write five. You're gonna write probably seven million bucks, right? Mm -hmm. So it's 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 you you literally you literally follow those processes. Do you mind sharing what they are? Yeah, there's a number of them. So Magic Fifty is my number one, which is like so we do saturation around houses. So our current listings that we've got, we do it's like layering around. Um, I don't know. 12, 12, 12, 25. 12, 12, 25, whatever it is. Everyone's got a different name for it. So you market to all the houses that live, or the people that live around that. So any campaign that we run, if we list a, a campaign, we will list two to three properties off the back of that campaign of locals, of neighbours. Without selling it, just listing it? Well, no, well, in the process, yeah. yeah so wow. if, we, if we don't do our Magic 50s correctly, we'll get no listings off the back of it. Sometimes we get too many listings on that street that we end up stopping the Magic Shit. 50s and do it in another spot because we end up getting too much stock in a street. Crazy, literally, and it's um. So that's a big one. Print obviously is a huge one. Um, so my KPIs are anywhere between five to ten pages a week, uh, in the Courier Mail, and that's what we do every single week, week in, week out. Um, social media is a big one. Five to ten thousand dollars spend per property. Um, obviously using our data for that. Um, auctions is another big one as All well. All properties auctions? Yeah, every well, uh, look, I would say eighty percent of my business is auction focused. Absolutely. Yep. 
Um, that's a that's a huge part of it. Um, all personal marketing is another big one. We do a huge amount of personal marketing. So every end of month, or end of quarter, we do a lot of that, uh, which goes out to 5,000 homes every single time without fail. Um, database communication is huge. So I've got say 1,700 people in my in my database. We'll run anywhere between 25 and 50 in my pipeline, which is people that are looking to come onto the market. Um, in the next sort of two to three months, I'll have and I'll manage that myself. My team manages the rest. So if I have someone in my pipeline mm -hmm. that says, oh, we're not gonna sell for six months, I pop them back into the database. My team communicates with them um, every maximum three months, but with our Magic 50s and most of it's in our core area, they'll get spoken to every week generally. Wow. So a lot of, it's a lot of outbound stuff as well. Yeah. Um, what else is there? Um, there's that and then um, auctions. Jeez, I'll have to. I'll, I'll send you what it is. I'm sort of holiday mode, yeah. <laughs> vacay mode. So I'm trying not to think about them, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it's it's what's worked really well for us. So that eight key focus is what we we hammer. And what's interesting is, you know, a year ago, or give me a year ago, when I was feeling shit about myself and the business before I saw this lady, it was like, mate, I I could have got beaten by anyone on uh, a listing. I was just negative, and it's like, so the one thing you will not you, I will not lose a, a listing from um, lack of enthusiasm. Literally, mm. like I'll, I will go into any listing presentation. I will, I will run rings around anyone based on energy, based on passion, based on market knowledge, based on my product knowledge of, of anything real estate, and I will not lose a listing against it. And it's, and I come from a different place as well. So, most people go, okay, well. Um, it's hard to beat an established agent because they've got the runs on the board, all those sorts of things. It's actually to beat, it's really easy to beat an established agent if they lose enthusiasm around what they're doing. Hmm. I will not lose enthusiasm. So sometimes I do feel sorry for some of the competition because they will not beat me on that. But one thing I love about real estate is there's not one perfect client for an agent, right? So I could go in and they, they might not like me. So, and I'm, I'm comfortable with that. But the reason I'm comfortable mm. with that is if I miss that listing, I've still got 10 of the other ones, which I'm getting anyway. And yeah. it's like, so we're, we're at a position now where this is what I love about it is mm. my team and I, we've decided that we only want to deal with people that we want to deal with and that want to deal with us. Wow. So we'll sit in, the, in, the, in our meeting and say, okay, well, is this person going to be a good fit for us? Were they nice and courteous on the phone or were they difficult on the phone? Are they, you know, are they going to be problematic over time? Are they going to listen to our recommendations? If they're not going to listen to our recommendations, generally it all goes to shit anyway. So we may as well not go on the market for three months and waste time. Um, so we like to choose and do things we enjoy now, which is, and I'll, I don't suggest anyone that's been in real estate starting out do that. Like you need to take on whatever you can and, and suck shit for as long as you can until you can make those decisions. And that has been one of the cool things that's made me want to stay mm. in real estate so again like i want to be in real i could be in real estate for the next 10 years easily mm. wow. the way i feel now wow what do you do on the bad days the hard days follow the process yeah <laughs> you just stick it through stick through the process and what happens is okay so this is it's, so rut you know the word rut mm. i'm in a rut oh <laughs> i'm in a shit spot i'm in a rut and it's like, oh, it's like most people that are in a rut, they, they're in a rut because they, 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 they've lost control of what they know they should be doing. Yeah. The only way to get out of a rut is to focus on the processes and, and, and the problem is you. So have you ever heard of, um, you know, it's like, you know, desperation, right? Like when people are desperate for a listing, oh, I've lost six listings in a row. Oh, oh they're, or that, that client was a fuckhead or this or that, making every excuse. There's a thing like you can smell it it's, and it's ugly. Mm. Like when you're desperate and when you need a listing and when you make your priorities over the client's priorities is when it gets, when it gets worse and worse and worse. And it's not until you realize that you need, the rut is not anyone else. The rut's not the market. Because, mate, if you look at this market, it's changed, right? Why are the best agents still writing um, phenomenal numbers? Like I've got people in our organization that sit there, they don't have any business. They're like, oh, the market's fucked. It's like, well... I just had a PB in November. How's the market fucked? Hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's a decision. So it's like a, you've got to make a choice. Is it me or is it the clients? Is it the market? Is it this or is it that? Stop making excuses and do what you say you're going to do. And what I find fascinating, I went and did a, a talk for a, a big law firm in Brisbane and they're like, 
what do you think the number one reason why real estate agents don't do well is? For me, it's so simple. It's so it's, they don't make the calls. They do, they fail. They fail to call enough people on a daily basis that own property and ask them if they want to sell. The number one reason. I agree. Yeah. What the hell? It's true. Well, like, so you so do you get a listing if you don't call a client? No. <laughs> like, well, it's true. Well, why aren't you calling clients? It's the number one thing they know they should be doing, and the number one thing that they don't do. And then they blame everything else, but they're making calls. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I'm in this right. Okay, well, you go into so anyone can get an overpriced, um, overpriced, no marketing and lowest commission. Like you can get that listing right, but most people that do that, they get the they guarantee the highest price. They get, they give them a really low fee and they do no marketing. Guess what happens? They work for three months on them. They don't get paid anyway. I oh, know. Goes to the next agent. He's easier to sell. And they get a better fee because the first agent didn't work because it was like they were a low cost fee. Yeah, <laughs> you Mental. know, it's one of, it's one of those things that it's um, you need to follow a process, stick to the plan, run a systemized business. If you don't have an ideal week, if you don't have a, a structure around what's important to you, what's going to win, like what's going to give you more listings, you're going to fail. Like there's no point in it. It's like it's mm. it's so I know every single day my time allocation of what I've got. I go into people, I'll, so look at a listing presentation, right? I allow two hours per presentation. Because what happens is, imagine if like all these agents, they're so busy and they go, they start looking at their watch through the presentation and then the, the vendor is like, they look at you and as soon as you do that, you're done. Mm. So I've got an agent in our office that keeps, he, he can't help himself, it's just a habit, <laughs> scrolls on Instagram halfway through what? a minute. Mate, you'd be shocked. Are you serious? You'd be shocked. Well, how many people do that? So, do you know what the solution to that is? Leave your phone in the Leave your car. fucking phone in the car. Set two hours. Like, you start looking at your watch. Wow. You, you're done. As soon as you do that, you're done. Yeah. So, set two hours, set more time. Don't be in a rush. Prioritize your time. Um, you know, if, like, we get, I just think, you know, people will have, like, there's different phases. Children's a big one, mm. right? Like, you get, I've got four children. Fuck. I've got four. Four. You know, like I was at, like at the office the other night, oh, I've got to go, I've got kids. I was like, yeah, I've got four. <laughs> what do you mean? <sighs> do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so you've got, it, it just, and if you want to go to that next level, you need to, you need to prioritize your time. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, it's like, it's getting easier now as time has gone on. That's through breakthrough. But once you, once you, um, you know, once you make a decision to go, well, I call it GoPro. That was, sacrifice. That was my next question. How do you actually manage kids, uh, health, fitness, as well as being a, a selling and managing a principal? Yep. So, um, yeah, I sort of look at it a lot. <laughs> and I think it's busy. It is busy. It's really busy. Well, one yeah. in business side, I've got an amazing business part. I've got amazing business partners across the group. Uh, but Hazley and I, we're, we're 50 50 in everything we do. Um, he does a lot of the back end stuff. I look after a certain part of the business. So the elite performers, chairman elite performers, he looks after associates and administration side. He does a lot of the one on ones. I lead. So the way we explain it, he's the the coach on the sidelines, on the on the um, the captain on the field. Captain. And it's so I bring them all with me. Either come or you don't. You know, yeah. and it's um and that's been, worked really well. So on the business side, we're it's it's we're doing it. Um, I think we do it pretty well. We've got 160 staff now across the group, which is uh, so it's wow. growing. I uh, took out number one international Ray White this year, which is pretty good. Let's go. Which is Congrats. good. It was a big, big, um, it was a Huge. long time coming. We've been going pretty hard at, 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 at gunning for that. Um, family stuff, it can it is can be challenging still. Hmm. Um, managing, you know, busy household, four kids. Uh, I've got a really amazing wife who just, she's a weapon. She knows what to do. Um, you know, we've got a bit of help as well, which is great. Um, but I still do the school drop-offs every single morning. I still get to all the, the um, school school things, like all the awards and all mm. those sorts of things. Hard thing I've, I've got coming for me, though, uh, will be school sport on a Saturday. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> well, you've got to just navigate your way around it. I'll make yeah. it happen. Like, I'm not going not, to miss it. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll just make it work as it comes and adapt and do whatever I need to do to make that happen. I, I, I won't be missing school support though. That's number one. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's um, as you get older, it's funny though, as you're getting older and as I'm getting better at what I'm doing, I'm loving it even more. And, mm. it's, um, and I'm just finding I can be a bit more flexible. But flexible to me isn't like, 
I'm at home. When I'm at home, my phone's glued to my ear. Like it's like literally, it's I'm on all of the time. And when I work, I work. When I'm off, I'm off. Yeah. And that's the big thing. So this year, I've worked really hard through the last. You know, we had a PB PB uh, November, my team for the month, which was epic. Mm. Um, and that was all planned. So we planned the whole thing. I was going to work up until this date, and then that's it. And mm. then now on holidays, which is that's amazing. Brilliant. And then you know you won't, they won't see me until the fifteenth of of January. But the coolest thing is we've got fourteen listings ready to go for January. Yeah, ready so to it's rock. all signed up, ready to go. So all the work's been done. I can stress stress free. Yeah, you know, you have a PB in November, have mm. December half of January off, and then no stress. Wow, no stress, and it feels great. And it's like I've just now I'm here with the kids. I've got wife, got our family coming down. We've got all the lunches booked and just can surf every day, can train and do my swimmer's ice baths every day. Oh, so stop it's, it. It's, it's good. Uh, life's, life's really, really good. It's good when you actually plan everything. Yeah. It's like most people don't plan, mm. you know, and that's where the stress comes in. And it's like this This year was the, the first year I actually feel complete. Like I've had the best year, best start to a financial year, best finish to a calendar year, best start, like the best, holiday than the best start to a um, new year mm. so I feel really really sent and feel, feel really grateful I've got a great team as well that's that awesome. works with me that's awesome um, mate my last question for you what would be like let's say someone's transitioning from being an associate agent yep. to being a standalone agent what would be your best piece of advice for someone in that position um, don't do it too soon learn mm. as much as you possibly can i've got a, i've got a, a a great young guy who works in my team ben osborne at the moment he's like he's he will be the next thing and he said something extremely profound to me the other day i, I did a performance meeting with him he's 21 years old he's like a gun like gun mm. um and i said so what do you think you need to do like what if you want to be the best what do you need to do and he see he said to me be patient and be ready to jump when you tell me to jump Hmm. And I was like, that's the first I've heard that. Most people go the other way. Oh, I'm going to knock you off next year. And, you know, like we go to every awards and yeah. like I, I get everyone come up to me and they're pissed and say, oh, I'm going to knock you off this year. And then, <laughs> so I said, oh, well, let's talk about that. Let's, I've got PT tomorrow morning at 5.30. Come and join me at that PT and we'll talk about it. They don't show up. Um, and it's like, and then they don't knock me off. No, they haven't. They haven't yet. They will try, but they haven't. Um, I just think don't go too soon. Um, a lot of young people that are really talented will go and um, will go too early, mm. and then they'll be out of the industry because it's too hard. It's, um, and because you know they don't have the experience. The other thing is they need to learn everything from the ground up. So most of them they work in a team where there's a PA, and then the associate comes out and they go, "Oh, that's, I've got a PA now." Like mm. it's like there's not one job not in what I do every day in our business. I created all of those systems. So there's not one system, not one job that I'm not prepared to do myself or know how to do myself. Mm. I know how to fold a letter. I know how to write a letter. I know how to print it on a printer. I know how to do it. And so if my PA it goes away for a week, I'll say, no, no, I've got this. We'll do it. I know how to build an ad. Most of these people, they don't know how to do it. They just think mm. that, oh, shit, that happens or I'll get a PA to do that. But when you come out to be your own, good luck affording yeah. a PA straight away learn every job that you th that you need to know in the industry learn it yourself like most of them don't even know how to read a contract they've never read a contract back to front <laughs> yeah do you know what i mean come across and, that before. and just don't be entitled just work your ass off and then do the hard yakka and then your time will come don't try to be the big dog from day one because you'll be out of the industry straight away legendary yeah well man i've got a last uh selfish question yeah because I'm, I'm really inspired by the Gold Coast yeah. and would love to have part of my business settle down here at some yeah. stage. What advice would you give to a buyer's agent or even an agent that's looking to change patch to yeah. well, develop? Well, I always say that you know, if I was to move to any marketplace anywhere in the country, it would take me six months. That's it? To be doing what you do now? Oh, no, to get moving. Yeah. Because I know what my processes are. Yeah. And I just stick to my processes of what I do. And, and I know that if I was to do it the way that I do it and make the calls and do the meet the people that I need to meet, I'll, I'll make that happen. But again, it's a sacrifice. <laughs> like mm. you, sh you move markets, you do something, you've got to sacrifice something. Um, with a buyer's advocacy, I think that that's easy because you just need to build relationships with agents. Mm. 
agency is agents are the gateway to to buyers agents right so if you go and build really strong relationships get them to refer you people your home and homes that's the number one thing like if i was an agent coming down here the first thing i'd do say if i was moving to the gold coast first thing i'd do is ring go and talk to every agent in the office and say hey give me all your old inspection lists anything that i list off i'll call through them anything i list off the back and i'll bring you in 50 50 mm. just get moving straight away because wow. a lot of people if you if you look at buyers lists that buyers that agents are using they don't go back 12 months ago and call those buyers lists there's yeah. no chance they're doing that imagine like or, or even though at the moment what i'd be doing this is a good little tip for anyone that wants um, some stuff right now is interest rates have gone up significantly right start calling all the people that bought in the last two years yeah that's a fucking that's a good one man. so start calling all the people people go oh five years seven year buying cycle seven years not when they had sub two, <laughs> not when they had sub two percent interest rates and interest rates have gone up to six percent. Yeah, They're, mate, you ring someone that's been a year in, they got a bit of mortgage stress, and you bring them an offer, they'll sell it. Yeah. So start focusing on the people that could be under mortgage stress. So calling all of the people that have been selling that that have bought in the last one, two, or three years, and saying, hey, the market shifted. Here's this. Would you consider a buyer? Imagine a peep, Imagine your call, and they, there's an old thing in real estate. They say. Uh, convenience trumps loyalty. Oh, I've got a relationship with so and so. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. But what if I brought you this cash offer here of this much money? And they go, Oh, yeah, that sounds good, but let me call them. <laughs> I'm selling it through you. Do you know what I mean? So start, bring it forward, call all the people that might have seen this interest rate stuff going on, and I'm sure you'll get some instant people that will say, If you can get me an offer, yep, we've been thinking about it. 100%. Legendary. Nelson, I really enjoyed that.